Again, um, I think this is a, a good segue into Dr. Swedane's talk um, that's going to be concentrating on endoscopic third ventriculostomy, which, um, is, like you mentioned, a, a workhorse of treating hydrocephalus, especially in pediatrics. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mark Swedane from uh, Cornell to give his talk on ETV. Thanks, Romain, and thanks, Uli. <clears throat> so I have the task of uh, really presenting to you more of a technical talk on endoscopic third ventriculostomy. As I mentioned before, I don't think there's any place where intraventricular endoscopy has made such an impact in the management of these patients in the pediatric sector as in hydrocephalus. So I, I noticed that in our poll earlier, there's uh, many who are logged on who are in training at that either medical school or resident level. So this talk will really be geared toward the technical nuances of doing this procedure. And I'll also say that as one evolves into a endoscopic surgeon, you've heard some really elegant talks, some complex applications. Uh, this really serves as a great format and foundation for learning how to handle the equipment, how to integrate with navigation, compatibility, issues such as room setup and irrigation. So this, sh this should serve as a very good entree for most of you into the, uh, the world of endoscopic interventricular surgery in, in children. Uh, uh, Uli has already spoken about uh, kind of the repertoire of uh, ways we treat hydrocephalus with endoscopy as an adjunct, and I won't uh, revisit those, <clears throat> and, uh, and it, we're, we're fortunate to have Dr. Worf talking about the, the decrease in CSF production through choroid plexus uh, ablation as well. <clears throat> so I'm going to focus purely on the, the utility of endoscopic third ventriculostomy, and a very basic element of that really is patient selection. Uh, understanding your patient population, understand, understanding uh, who will benefit and who will not has become a real predictive element for success of this type of uh, procedure. So trying to discriminate between the communicating and the classic communicating and non-communicating forms of hydrocephalus has been instrumental in, in patient selection. Uh, we've evolved in the, in the classification of these, not just based on ventricular morphology, but real fine-scale imaging with great fidelity of the subarachnoid space of the intraventricular compartment. I'll come back to that issue in a moment. But that very basic element of defining uh, whether or not this is uh, intraventricular obstructive hydrocephalus or extraventricular obstructive hydrocephalus is crucial. And this is not a new element since the advent of endoscopic third ventriculostomy. Uh, this has been published uh, well over 50, 60 years ago uh, when translaminate terminalis uh, microsurgery opening of the third ventricle uh, was explored and the predictive element of uh, young children versus older adults and communicating versus non-communicating hydrocephalus. As, as imaging has paralleled, or I should say our talents have paralleled the, the imaging fidelity, this really plays an important role in documenting really what your surgical objectives should be in the management of hydrocephalus in, in these uh, children. Uh, first, in the, in the very basic element is, is there noticeable obstruction somewhere in the interventricular compartment? That, that's a very basic element here. A series of images here selected from some MRI scans show you it, with real good elegance where those sites of obstruction are. And for most points of uh, discussion today with regard to ETV, really anything downstream from the atidum of the aqueduct is, is where we see most of these obstructive lesions. So in the posterior third, by way of tumors, congenital malformations, within the cerebral aqueduct itself and the tectum, and then outlet the obstruction in the foramina of Lushka and Magendi also serve as another great prototype. Um, and I'll say a word about uh, tumors of the fourth ventricle as we move forward. So understanding the etiology uh, after categorizing communicating versus non-communicating hydrocephalus is essential. Uh, age will play a role, uh, as I said, has been really recognized 40, 50 years ago and has evolved as far as uh, how we select those patients. And the other thing I'll comment on later on in the talk is, does a previous shunt uh, in any way omit somebody from a, being an adequate candidate for an endoscopic third ventriculostomy? Uh, with regard to the imaging, CT and its basic elements will very nicely demonstrate triventricular hydrocephalus, so an obstructive lesion somewhere near the aqueduct. It's pretty fail-safe, but what it fails to do is indicate the exact etiology, cisternal anatomy, the prepontine cistern, position of the basilar artery, uh, small webs and membranes that might not be noticeable on CT scan. Uh, 
So MRSERS is a, a very useful, if not critical, adjunct in the preoperative evaluation of these individuals. And there's, there's rare exceptions to that. And with, with, with some of the high-resolution 2D sequences, 2D phase contrast, CISS, as Uli had mentioned, really the, there, there's really that is very uh, poorly not defined with, with uh, these high-resolution T2 images. So I'd encourage you to explore these options as a preoperative adjunct with your neuroradiologist. Another example of a globular glioma where there's a fairly long segment aqueductal stenosis. I'll say a brief word about aqueductal stenting and uh, aqueductoplasty as Uli already introduced. But all these are great candidates for endoscopic third ventriculostomy. Uh, pineal region cyst obstruction, the proximal aspect of the, the aqueduct here. Uh, another great candidate for ETV, downward bowing of the, uh, the tuber scenarium, a fairly classic. Tumors in the posterior third ventricular area, whether they arise from the third ventricle or the tectum or the pineal region, all excellent candidates with a high predictive uh, expectation that the, the ETB will subserve that population well. You know, this idea of patient selection has been elegantly demonstrated by Ab Kulkarni in, in Toronto, validated subsequently by others with regard to patient selection. And everybody intuitively uses age, etiology of hydrocephalus, and previous shunt placement as pretty good predictors of the candidacy for ETV. Um, and these are broken out in that, in that paper by Ab uh, some years ago. And there's always a lot of dynamic interchange between is there an absolute threshold in age? Is it three months? Is it six months? Is it 12 months? And it's really a composite of not just age, but also etiology. And personally, I view a three-month-old much differently if they have a pure short-segment aqueductal stenosis versus a infant with post-meningitic hydrocephalus. So integrating these other elements into etiology become extremely important. Regardless of the predictive value of this, it really falls into a very comprehensive discourse with the family uh, about uh, their intuition, uh, their desires, well, how they prioritize certain elements of this. Um, but uh, clearly, I think you can, you can increase your success by a very good patient selection. Uh, I did talk about uh, high-resolution MR imaging as, a, uh, as another screening tool. Uh, a lot has been made of flow-sensitive sequences, 2D phase contrast, and otherwise you see here with regard to the, the aqueductal patency and trying to determine whether or not the aqueduct is open. I find it very useful in some flare-related signals, uh, flare-related uh, sequences, and high-res T2, T2 cubed images that there, there's really very little that is, that is lost in those sequences relative to the, the motion-sensitive sequences as you see here. I don't use it much as an adjunct up front, but in reconsidering whether or not a child is a candidate for refenestration, I, I rely on it quite heavily, and I'll talk about redo ETV in a moment. So there's plenty of information uh, published on the technical nuances of performing an ETV, and I'll, and I'll compartmentalize this by simply saying that we're all very well trained to access the frontal horn, the lateral ventricle, using anatomical landmarks. Uli showed some adjuncts to do that. Um, that's really, th those are all governed about approaching the frame in a Monroe, but a lot happens below the frame in a Monroe when you're doing an ETV. And as some of these papers have been established with regard to the, the anatomical landmarks of uh, introducing this scope, you, you'll see as you do more and more of these that there's a fair amount of variance, uh, even on laterality with regard to selecting the, the, the frontal uh, right side or left side. But you'll see in this scatter plot by Peter Nakaji's group at the Barrow um, that if you look retrospectively, if you use navigational guidance, that your burr hole changes tremendously through large variance, uh, both in an anterior, posterior, and sagittal uh, dimension, as well as a coronal plane. And it, if one were to try and uh, to make a statement about this, it, relative to our normal standard approach for place and externalized ventricular drains, these burr holes tend to be somewhat more posterior, closer to the coronal suture. Uli had made the comment about uh, the midline approach, and while that's not possible through a straight midline approach, the more parasagittal you become, the more that variance is exaggerated in the third ventricle. So as a general premise, as you're going into the third ventricle, keeping that more adherent to the midline uh, within a centimeter and a half, two centimeters, I find it to be very advantageous to minimize that that uh, obtuse angle once you get into the third ventricle. 
So, uh, you know, navigational guidance, how useful it is, is it for selecting patients? I mean, using this for ETV. If you have it, it's an easy adjunct. We use it almost unanimously today. Uh, there's this idea that, well, the ventricles are big. It's not hard to cannulate. That is true. Uh, but if you take into consideration the cor cortical, the gyral form uh, patterns, the sulci, uh, variants in, in things such as the hypothalamus, I, I find it is a very useful adjunct. It's not critical in most cases of non concating hydrocephalus. But nevertheless, I, I think it does minimize some intraoperative uh, uh, tweaking, if you will. So in the, in the realm of trajectory planning, I, I always uh, tell our residents and our fellows in training, there's, there's really three things you should think about. It's the entry site, and not so much the bony anatomy, but the gyral and, and sulci anatomy. And that's not just limited to the cortical surface, but when you're close to the midline, also the interhemispheric sulci, the, the interposition of those, the, uh, the colossal sulcus, the, the, the arteries that run through these deep sulci. So there, there is a happy medium as far as how close you can get to the midline. The next subject is the path of the catheter, um, uh, functional areas, the caudate, uh, the head of the caudate, internal capsule. All these uh, theoretically and practically are at risk. And then through the frame in Monroe, really the, the next, next set of uh, questions and considerations with regard to navigational guidance is what about below your target? So the tuber scenario in ETV, for instance. So I always say that as I've done more and more ETVs, my mindset has been to try and approximate a parallel to the rostral part of the clivus. That's the cistern you're going to be approaching. You can easily get to the tuber scenarium through a lot of excursions, as you can see up here on the cortical surface. But really, as you start to move more forward, your trajectory is going to be into the front of the uh, pontine segment of the, of the brainstem, the basilar artery. And likewise, as you move more posteriorly into the, into the, cell, into the uh, dorsal aspect of the clivus. So if you do have to... Uh, push through the tuber scenario, you can uh, have some limitations there and potential risk in doing so. So those elements all become extremely important from the standpoint of navigational guidance. Uh, this red arrow depicts the coronal suture. And again, a lot of variance is getting in the lateral ventricle, more variance getting through the frame in Monroe, but very, very refined at the, at the site of the fenestration. Uh, the fenestration site, I want to highlight some of the anatomical issues here. Uh, first and foremost, uh, as you see in uh, some of these earlier publications by leaders in the field, Charlie Teo, uh, Robert Jones, the floor of the third ventricle is perforated between the infundibular recess and the pituitary stalk. Here's the infundibular recess, mammillary bodies, um, and, a, and, a, and a midline sagittal plane between those is a pretty good estimation, but there's a lot of variance in that dimension of the prepontine cistern. I'm going to show some uh, examples of that. I'll say that if, if I'd learned anything along the way, it's, it's really to utilize the dorsum cella is probably your best landmark from the standpoint if you can select and see through the tuber scenario, since that puts you as far away from the basilar artery as possible and still provides you with a conduit into the prepontine cistern. So the dorsum cella, I think, serves as an amazing landmark and probably the safest landmark. And this was born out of experience from the standpoint of making perforations and after getting through the tuber scenarium, seeing the basilar artery in front of us with the perforators coming posteriorly, and that's probably happened uh, close to a half a dozen times in my experience. So again, trying to go as far forward as possible without uh, violating that uh, coronal plane of the, the, the dorsum cella. Um, is the risk any higher in going through the pituitary stalk or the infundibular recess? Um, there is reported somewhere about a 1% risk of DI and, uh, and endocrine dysfunction which is temporarily in, temporary in most of these. Uh, I haven't seen it as that high, but that is the potential risk. And I will say it becomes more richly vascularized as you move closer and closer toward the infundibular recess. Pertinent anatomy here through the right lateral ventricle, the fornix on the anteromedial aspect of the frame in Monroe, the septum pellucidum, the almost striate vein and the choroid plexus uh, with the anterior caudate vein here, looking into the third ventricle with great clarity. Anatomical recognition becomes so crucial. And as you start to push the field or your repertoire of indications, rarely is every anatomical indicator there present in its glory. So you, you end up relying on some segments of a, of a, of a beautiful a vision like this. And it might be just choroid plexus, or it may just be the thalamus striate vein. So, so having the confidence built into your own experience gives you a, a great uh, confidence in doing this. Uh, 
choroid plexus becomes probably one of the most standard landmarks when approaching the frontal horn. Uh, if you see it, you usually want to move anterior, logically. If you don't see it, it usually means you've cannulated the frontal horn and you want to move more posteriorly to, to reach the frame in Monroe. Inside the third ventricle, the, the real standards are the infundibular recess, usually a deep red invagination, a funnel-shaped uh, object. Uh, the dorsum cella, this, this white uh, excrescence of bone, and in bad hydrocephaly, you'll see the tuberous scenarium draped over it and pushed uh, in front and in back of it. Basilar artery and mammillary bodies here. Uh, and again, looking at that, that sagittal plane, uh, midway between there approximates the dorsum cella, but uh, sometimes uh, I will actually use my blunt forceps to palpate and look for that bony protuberance. The technique of fenestration, once you identify where you want to go in, and again, I'll stress you want to be midline or as midline as possible. And if you're going to err on either side of midline in the sagittal plane, err toward the ipsilateral side. Because as you go through the tuber scenarium, there can be fairly large excursions pushing the tuber scenarium down, and you can end up in the mid clival plane uh, close to the sixth nerve and, and close to the pecan if you err too far to the contralateral side. Blunt perforation is what I utilize almost uh, standardly, <clears throat> and I'll talk about rare exceptions to that. And once that uh, blunt perforation is uh, performed, I use uh, rounded blunt uh, uh, biopsy forceps, uh, embolectomy catheters. Uh, Charlie Teo, a master of the field, espouses using the idea of uh, the scope itself under direct vision. Uh, I don't like to lose that visual uh, indicator for that transient amount of time, but it, it's worked extremely well in his hands. So whatever is used in a blunt uh, format, then it's dilated usually with an embolectomy catheter. And a lot of variety of catheters, oblong, wasted, spherical catheters are, are, are certainly available for use. And importantly, the next uh, objective from a technical standpoint is violating the, the membrane of Lilyquist. And I'll show you some examples of that. And then identifying and making some statement about the prepontine cistern. And I'm sure Dr. Worf will talk about this as well. So those are the basic elements you see here through a fenestration, mammillary bodies here, membrane of Lilyquist here, always wanted to make sure that's open and a clear prepontine cistern without a lot of obscuration and opacity, a very good looking subarachnoid space uh, is pretty predictive of an effective ETB. The orientation here from an anatomical sense, again, you're looking at, um, there's a tumor here in the back of the third ventricle, mammillary bodies here, starting to see dorsum cella and infundibular recess. And infundibular recess is going to be highly variable as its, as its uh, indications. Maybe some tumor infiltrating it. But the anatomical observation and recognition becomes crucial. Another example here with the technique superimposed on it, right frontal approach. Uh, you'll see that, uh, and, I, and I want to stress this, when passing the scope into the frame in Monroe, whether using an angled lens or a zero-degree lens, you always want to favor the anterior compartment or anterior aspect of the frame in Monroe because you always have to think about what's behind you and what you're approximating with the shaft of the scope. And you're going through the frame in a Monroe, it's the thalamus striate vein, it's the choroid plexus, which can hemorrhage. So I always want to favor the anterior uh, part of that uh, foramen in going through to uh, perform the ETB. Another example here, you'll always see me move the scope a little anterior away from the thalamus striate. Wonderful uh, visualization of both P1 segments, the basilar apex, uh, the, the dorsum cella, infundibular recess, and optic chiasm with the expected pulsations you'll see there. <coughs> Excuse me. Commonly what you'll see if you make the initial fenestration is this bulging of the floor, usually from egress of CSF. And I'll stress that when you're doing intraventricular endoscopy, you always, always want a dedicated egress portal. There is certainly plenty of case reports of increasing intracranial pressure and asystole. So having an egress portal is important. You'll see as we make that fenestration, that tuber scenario usually starts to flop in your face and sometimes obscures your view, but that's a, you'll see this start to flap and pulsate consistent with the cardiac cycle. See here, membrane of Lilyquist perforated at the same time. Sometimes it's done separately, but you always want to make sure that's open. And usually it's the same technique. Uh, early on in my career, I always used to pass the scope through the stoma. I, I, you don't have to go that deep. I keep it at the stoma. No reason to potentially risk the six cranial nerves or the perforating vessels of the basilar apex. <clears throat> uh, an example here of uh, separating out membrane of Lilyquist. Just a, a little technical error you see here is here's the midline. You see where our initial perforation is a little bit to the left of midline. Uh, 
And, and you'll see as we do this, it becomes somewhat more difficult to work because of this really patchless floor. Uh, but nevertheless, this is used to demonstrate how membrane oliliquis can be quite uh, uh, stubborn <clears throat> and a lot more difficult to perforate. We're using the biopsy forceps to spread the tubercinarium and to find liliquis there since there, there seems to be a lot of deformation as we're pushing on it. I'm going to be a little bit more careful, even some micro hemorrhages here from doing that. Dorsum cellae, you see beautifully here. So again, I'm pushing myself to go as far in interior as I possibly can. Liliquis being a little stubborn there with the embolectomy catheter. Eventually, we, we punch through it and use a standard technique to get through it. But uh, the point is here, be confident that you've gone through both membranes. Liliquis here, tuberosinarium here, and a nice fenestration around the basilar artery uh, through membrane of Liliquis. <clears throat> I'll show you uh, some continued examples. Uh, again, going through the right foramen of Monroe, fornix, anatomical landmarks, noem, noem like the back of your hand. You start to see the infundibular recess up here. Basilar artery, not as obvious. Um, so uh, where you make that fenestration, you might see a, a shadow of it here, but this can be quite variable. Again, I try and approximate where dorsum cella is then make that fenestration just behind it. Again, midline, there's that tendency to always veer a little bit to the left. So I usually start my fenestration a little bit more to the ipsilateral side today than I would have 10 years ago. Um, you should get another great view of a Lilliquist membrane here as the balloon comes down. There you see it there, still needs more work. See the catheter pushing off that? This is insufficient. You can usually tell that just based on direct observation as well as the fact that that, look at the tuber scenario, how it's pulsating minimally until we get Lilliquist open. And you'll see this start to flap much more uh, vibrantly with the, uh, the cardiac cycle once we get through a Lilliquist membrane, once that balloon comes down. There you see that uh, more vigorous pulsations. Lilliquist is open here. So don't be fooled by it. Um, always make sure you're through it. Another nuance from the standpoint of patient selection, I'm going to show you somewhat uh, a, a longer video from the standpoint of room setup. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Uribe and Lara who have uh, put these uh, uh, demonstrations together. And, but from the standpoint of the, the, the typical setup, it's not much different than what you've been uh, shown uh, these particular, this particular instant infant. So, uh, of course, we've had that discussion with the parents about the, the, the valid nature of doing an ETV versus a shunt procedure, <clears throat> confirmed with hydrocephalus, with the ultrasound, subsequently MRI scan, pure aqueductal stenosis, bowing of the third ventricle. So, again, the pathology is pure aqueductal stenosis here, uh, 30, 40 percent chance of functionality, I think uh, some parents would gladly take. Uh, the planned incision in this particular case, lateral aspect of the anterior fontanelle, local anesthetic at the entry site. Always, always, always making sure you have functional equipment from the standpoint of image resolution, weight balance, orientation. Very typical approach. Um, you'll see here Peter Morgenstern, one of our chief residents, uh, holding the scope sheath. It depends on the scope you use. Disposable fiber optic systems, easy to do this with one surgeon. Uh, the, the more vibrant solid lens systems, heavier cameras at the back end of this, usually it's two individuals. Somebody using the, uh, uh, the scope sheath itself and the other person passing the instruments. Relevant anatomy here. We've been through this already. I'll, I'll speed it up a little bit. Again, you'll see me move the scope somewhat anterior away from the thalamostriate as we go into the frame in Monroe. Wonderful anatomy. Dorsum cella here. And basilar apex with all these perforators. Again, this is, if this were more opaque, you could easily see how one might go behind the basilar apex and put those perforators at risk. Um, and then once we define that anatomy, <coughs> excuse me, the rest is relatively straightforward from the standpoint of what I've pointed out already. Balloon catheter dilatation. I still use a, a regular standard three French embolectomy catheter. I've never adopted the, the, the figure of eight or a wasted issue. See so two-person two procedure here. Again, with a lighter scope, not necessary. I'm passing instruments, Dr. Morgan's turn, holding the scope. Uh, small, small excursions of the scope. Yeah, the question comes up a lot, should you use a scope holder? Literally, once you cannulate the ventricle, this is about a five to 10 minute operation. So I've, I, I do away with the scope holder for this type of work. And I find there's also some micro adjustments that are almost crucial. So the scope holder, I think, is very cumbersome and probably not necessary in the majority of these cases. In situations of selecting candidacy, <coughs> excuse me, seeing several patients with this idea that there, there's no prepontine cistern. You see the basilar artery here. In our original publications, looking at the candidacy of this, these patients have responded universally as well. 
Technique needs to change a little bit. You see that basilar trunk is pushed right up against the clivus. We go just off center. Sometimes we'll pull up the tuber scenarium away from the prepontine cistern. And this is one of the rare situations where I might use cautery. I don't know if it's demonstrated in this video or not. Right on the dorsum cella to tear the dorsum cella and then dilate it up accordingly. And usually you'll see the brainstem fall away from the, the clivus after this is done. Um, and again, excellent demonstration of a, of a patent system. So even in the situation where that uh, dorsum cella is pushed up against the basilar artery, uh, those patients are candidates. Another great example here, here's basilar apex, no space during systole between that and the dorsum cella. So now I'm working purely on the dorsum cella so as not to injure uh, the vascular tributaries, just off center, trying to tear that with some resistance against the dorsum cella, sometimes with cautery, and that works extremely well. Um, not to belabor the point, but can be done. Uh, and I, again, I find navigational guidance here extremely crucial because I want that trajectory of the scope once through the tuber scenarium to be parallel with the upper clivus so that I'm not angling back toward the brainstem or uh, front toward the, uh, the clivus, which makes this pushing down maneuver very difficult. As far as outcome assessment, uh, clearly resolution of signs and symptoms is the most uh, important element as to whether or not what you've done is, is helpful for the individual. Uh, very few individuals, I, I think, have relied on intracranial pressure monitoring anymore. We never leave an EVD for uh, de novo treatment of hydrocephalus with aqueductal stenosis or other forms of obstructive hydrocephalus. Uh, Intraoptive observation, this idea that the subarachnoid space is, is, is not obscured. There's good pulsatility of the floor. We published on that. There's been plenty published on ventricular size, ventricular volume. But the, the, the real gold standard, obviously, is resolution of signs and symptoms. And in the young child, plateauing of, of a head circumference. MR beautifully demonstrates turbulent flow pattern on the right sequences, T2 and flare. Mammillary bodies here in a mid-sagittal plane, uh, basically an empty cella syndrome, the floor fenestrated, and this turbulent flow on either side of the tuber scenarium is, is, is very, very uh, indicative of a patent stoma. It doesn't tell you anything about absorptive at the subarachnoid space, but the stoma is clearly functional. <clears throat> Other soft indicators you'll see have to do with, uh, as I mentioned, ventricular volume, but patent stoma here, sometimes the shape of the, uh, the tuber scenarium and the angulation of that is helpful. Uh, displacement of the tonsils here, pre-op versus post-op, kind of these subtle changes that one would expect to see. Another demonstration of it here of a tuber scenarium bowed down toward the prepontine cistern, now elevated. Increase in subarachnoid spaces and patency of the uh, subarachnoid spaces are almost always obvious on the sagittal or coronal planes. So they're usually pretty good indicators that, that the communication is patent and functional. <clears throat> Excuse me. And flow-related sequences uh, published again by the Toronto group that was very predictive of success. Uh, and you don't see it uh, less specific, but certainly nevertheless a, a good adjunct. And as I mentioned before, I like to use this when I'm considering uh, reopening up the, uh, the floor of the third ventricle on a repeat ETB. Flow-related sequences I think are probably even superior to, uh, relative to flow-sensitive sequences extremely sensitive to turbulent flow patterns pre and post-op. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I like to use a lot. What about the patient who comes with a shunt malfunction, known aqueductal stenosis? Uh, several publications have addressed this. The group in uh, Salt Lake uh, ha has looked at this in the past. Uh, in the presence of a previous shunt, you can see that the uh, success rate uh, can be quite good, 80% uh, in that series of shunt-free uh, uh, situation. So conversion from a uh, shunt-dependent child to somebody without complications, however, go up somewhat. And that's expected based on aberrant anatomy. And the other important issue here is the reliance on, uh, on a, a intracranial pressure monitoring and having an EBD, which I strongly support if you've got a patient who's shunt dependent and try to convert them. <clears throat> it makes great sense to have that confidence postoperatively. And if one's going to go down the avenue of repeated ETV, this comes up a lot. Should you repeat in, a, in the presence of a failure? I say if that interval of time is relatively long, measured in several months versus weeks, then it makes perfect sense. Clearly measured in years, there's no question that I think uh, a repeat ETB is the, the treatment of choice and the, the right approach. Shortening that to, to, to weeks, it makes, uh, and I think it behooves you to think about VP shunting instead of a repeat ETB, <clears throat> providing the anatomical substrate look good. Here's an example of a repeat. Uh, here's the original pre-op film. Post-op, you see the turbulent flow across the tuber scenario. That's your first ETB. 
uh, immediately post-op, they always get a baseline loss of signal, loss of turbulent flow pattern. Uh, again, people feel differently based on symptom resolution or not, but uh, I think the loss of signal is extremely predictive of a failed ETV. You see a repeat uh, indicator here. This is fairly typical in the patients that I've treated where you see the tuber scenarium looks like it's pretty much vacant at the site of the stoma, but there's scar formation along the arachnoid uh, consistent with the Lilyquist membrane that is usually found to be the culprit. And that just opened up in a similar technique. Um, and again, making sure from the standpoint of prognosticating, is the subarachnoid space clear? Is it full of opacities? And that turbulent flow pattern, again, is somewhat predictive. So in the, in the face of a previous shunt, I always consider it, providing that the etiology is known to be aqueductal stenosis. Shunt infection, post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus, lowers that. That expectation is going to work. Uh, no more better indicator for getting high-resolution imaging in this population. There's a lot of usually hemocytorin staining, synechia around the ventricular compartment. Uh, so navigational guidance here, strong imaging requisites are extremely important. Rarely will ever go to the OR with a known case of aqueductal stenosis and shunt malfunction without an MR. So uh, always use it. But as I mentioned before, be very, very uh, prepared for aberrant anatomy and use of navigational guidance. Um, what to do about the shunt, a lot of debate, really depends on several issues. I tend to leave the distal components alone, uh, waiting for establishment of, or confirmation of that the ETB is functional, um, and then depending on that, either ligate or extract at a, at a separate uh, procedure. So in conclusion for ETB, this is the workhorse of the pediatric neurosurgeon treating for hydrocephalus. Always consider it, always get the appropriate imaging and, and use that in your communication with the parents. Patient selection, no question, is going to predict success. You know, I'll quote uh, rates as high as 95% in an adolescent with aqueductal stenosis uh, relative to an infant with an aqueductal stenosis where it drops to 30%, 40%. The technique, as I mentioned, I highlighted some of the issues, um, practice, coursework, manuals. These types of uh, dissertations are extremely important in feeling confident about the equipment. And the other is, in the initial reports by Jim Drake and his group about sudden death after ETB with failure, I, I do still, to this day, require that these patients be evaluated with imaging on an annual basis. And I will act on loss of turbulent flow on an MRI scan, even in the absence of symptoms. I liken this to the shunt that's been disconnected and requires an elective revision. So surveillance remains a, a mandate. These kids are not cured of hydrocephalus, but treated um, with that all. I'll close, and if we have any time for questions, take those questions. Thank you. Unshare your screen. Thank you very much, Dr. Swedain. Um, obviously, uh, the probably the most uh, relevant type of endoscopic surgery we do right now um, today is the ETV <laughs> procedure. Um, we're, we're running right on time, but I, I would like to ask one question that I think um, a lot of us uh, probably have which is related to your opening of the membrane of Lilliquist. Uh, you mentioned that you try and open it all at the same time. Obviously, that would be ideal. Uh, at times, that the angle of the prepontine cistern is very oblique and very uh, uh, increased, which makes your opening of the floor not so hard, but then the Lilliquist membrane is almost behind you, mm -hmm. and you're almost at a parallel angle with your scope. Are there any tricks you use in those cases to open Lilliquist? No, I don't think tricks. I think just a lot of caution. You know, if you do have an attachment near the mammillary bodies or more posterior, usually as you go further down in the prepontine cistern, so I'll switch to, say, a, a monopolar without current. I can actually grab the membrane, pull it away from the basilar artery or the brainstem surface. Rarely I'll use grasping forceps to do the same. So just by grabbing that arachnoid and moving your scope ever so slightly forward toward the, uh, toward the clivus, we'll tear that membrane okay. open. Um, but again, uh, the other thing I'll say here is if you find yourself in a situation where technically this is becoming problematic and in your best estimation, risky, we have a great fallback and that's shunting. So there's nothing wrong with aborting these procedures if in your best estimation this is, this is not working well or smoothly. Absolutely. Um, we, we, have a, we have a couple questions that have come in. Uh, one of them says, what's the ideal age for an ETV in non-communicating hydrocephalus? Um, I think uh, a lot of us sometimes see uh, almost no age potential uh, when it's non-communicating hydrocephalus. What's your view? Yeah, I, you know, the ideal age is older. 
you know, if, if, <laughs> you know, that's the best way of answering the question, right? And I think if you polled everybody who does a, does a lot of endoscopic third ventriculostomy, it'll be quite variable. But as I mentioned before, it's not unidimensional. It's age and etiology. And it's also the sentiment of the individuals and the parents that you're speaking to with, with whom you're going to get consent. And no parent that, uh, that I take a child to the OR who's less than the age of six months doesn't know that there's a 40%, 50% chance I'm coming back to, to place a shunt at some point in the near future. So, so it really has to do with that element of the interface with the parent. But I think safely saying cure aqueductal stenosis, I still do this less than six months with the expectation that there's going to be about a 40 to 50% failure rate. And also um, the question about rigid versus flexible endoscopy. Obviously, right now the optics are one of the, probably the biggest driver in a lot of places that don't have necessarily a good digital flexible endoscope. What's your um, what's your usage of one versus the other, or, and or the the times in which you'd use one versus the other? Yeah, I mean, we we obviously have a whole repertoire of scopes: uh, steerable, fiber optic, disposable, single channel, multi channel, large channels that we use for intraventricular work. But I think that, and Dr. Worf will probably talk about the flexible system as well. It depends on the application, really. But but I will say that for endoscopic third ventriculostomy. Nearly any scope designed for intraventricular work is going to suffice. You don't need the high-res HD solid lens system for doing endoscopic third ventriculostomy. I th certainly think a fiber optic disposable or non-disposable system works very, very sufficiently. So I don't, I don't think that there's a, uh, that there's a dictum you can create with regard to the t scope technology that applies to ETV. It's dictated more based on the, the procedures themselves and the indications as you'll hear from Dr. Worf's talk where a solid lens system is probably not going to be as effective as what you'd want. Same thing for posterior third ventricular work or pineal region tumors, for instance. But for ETB, I think most scopes on the market that are intended for intraventricular work are sufficient. Great. Well, thank you very much. A wonderful talk.